Um, Beth got a good guffaw. I had sent in the notes for the introduction previously and Beth hadn't read them. And this business about organizing and having a date to get ready, you know, we don't have any of those dates now. Like, so here goes. Um, so we, we've traveled with overseas adventure travel a handful of times, more than a handful of times. A number of people around here may have heard of them or gone on their trips. This trip was 21 days in seven locations with four plane flights in country, uh, train ride, uh, coaches, buses, and a boat for three nights. So Beijing, you can look on the map. We did not go to Shanghai. I made the cursor nice and big so I can point things out. We went from Beijing down to Xi'an, over to Chengdu, that's the train ride, out to Lhasa, Tibet, back to Chongqing, down the river on a boat, and then a bus to Wuhan that we all know about, but we only were there one night. Don't worry about us, you can, you can hang around. You won't catch it over the internet. Um, and then they would have had a post extension trip, but neither of these extension trips happened. This just happened to be the easiest map because a real map of China has an incredible amount of detail in it. And uh, all the photos were taken with either iPhones or a, a nice Sony uh, pocket camera. I mean, so I'll get it there in the picture. So nothing terribly large and long lenses or anything. So about a third were taken with the, the pocket camera and the others were all uh, the iPhone. So let's go. <clears throat> this is our hotel uh, in Chengdu. Um, obvious panda theme. There was actually a little electric panda that would come to your room and bring you beverages, you know, like a, a little robot that you could order from. Um, the panda base, well, this is on the way to the, to the panda site. Uh, everything there is just theme panda. This is the entrance and looks like a theme park because it's a theme park more or less with, you know, or a zoo. Uh, this was founded in 1987 and now there's over a hundred pandas off in the woods. Um, it's estimated there are about two or 3,000 giant pandas in the world. Um, and uh, so you may recall that Nixon received two giant pandas in 1972 as part of the opening up trade with China uh, back in the day. And, uh, you know, there's tour groups. This fella has a flag over here on the right. We have a little red umbrella over on the left. You follow your tour guides around or you can, you can certainly be there on their own. If you see any Western faces, they are our group. Um, everybody else there is uh, Chinese, most likely. Um, that's largely the case with the whole trip. If you'll see some faces over and over, jackets over and over, and they're all in our group. So the giant panda's diet is about 99% bamboo. Uh, they either eat or sleep or else perform other bodily functions. Uh, they, the, the good news is we were there in the morning um, when some of them were active, but some of them were already sleeping. So, this is a panda climbing a tree. They don't seem to be terribly good at it. Yeah, I think he's more eating the stuff on the way up the tree. But you wonder if they'll ever get there. They weigh 250 to 300 pounds for a large one in, in captivity, maybe 350. The, in the wild, they, the top weight is more like 250. So proof that we were there and there's two pandas sleeping back in the tree. And this is what they do. Okay, that stops. We don't need to watch any more of that. <laughs> they move around. You know, we watch them move around a little bit, but it seems really uncomfortable to hang out in a tree like this, but this one stayed like this for, you know, the whole time we were standing there. And now the good news is, is there's, uh, this is, the, they raise pandas there, um, they mate and so forth. And they're, they're incredibly uh, unable to take care of themselves. Um, they're often born in pairs and oftentimes most often the mother abandons one or the other. So in the, uh, in the center there, uh, in the panda birthing center and so forth, they actually uh, swap out the infants 
with the mother. Uh, they're not they're not paying a lot of attention apparently, but they they keep track of one. They keep them warm and they feed them with a bottle and so forth. And then then every once in a while they swap it with the one that the mother is taking care of, and that's how they get twice as many pandas. Um, we were there. Notice that this is not Mickey Mouse on the screen with the ears. <laughs> this is this is their theme is panda, right? So this is this one's about six weeks old, or sorry, about three and a half months old. Um, so nine or nine to eleven months old, um, and that's how much it moved. And now this one is the real infant in the scene. Um, this was born October 11th, and I think we were there on the 25th. So it's two weeks old. Now, what's not shown is that there's a big line to get into this building, and then they kind of herd you through the building. And Beth was clever enough that she said, oh, I know how to get back in this line. Although you had to walk around a lot of other stuff, she walked back into the line and, and got to see it twice and, and take some of the, the, the pictures inside. Um, back outside, an action shot. Now this is the fun guy. There's only a couple of them doing this, but so I don't know who prepares the, the bamboo for them on the side. I mean, somebody cut it up and put it in there, but. This is what he does. This is not speeded up. This is not slowed down. Next. <laughs> this is a lot of roughage. So the, the ancestor ancient ancestor, I'll say of the giant panda is, is a bear. Um, they're not directly related to any of our bears, but they're, they're ancestors similar. There's actually a red panda there and at the uh, facility too. They're small and they look like a raccoon because they're actually descended from, from raccoons, but because a lot like raccoons look like uh, a panda, they, um, you know, they, they call them pandas. And like every good theme park, it says exit through the gift shop. And uh, these are some uh, uh, Dealey Bobber things that Beth bought for our daughter and a friend. Um, John Boyer is on here somewhere watching tonight and I could not find a ski helmet cover like he has mm -hmm. to either replace his or copy his, but all things Panda are available there. So, now we're going to move on. Oh, by the way, let me just say that 10 or 20,000 people could visit something like this a day, maybe 10,000. Um, it was quite a large facility, but I did some math and things like the, the terracotta warriors and the great wall and all that in China, everybody that's come to China from the United States or a lot of other countries has probably seen the great wall and you know a, a lot of the other things we've heard of. But even if, say, the Great Wall had 50,000 visitors a day spread out over its various places that you go visit it, the population of China is 1.4 billion. If 50,000 people visit a day, it would take over 75 years for everyone to have visited. Now, I imagine that there's a lot of the people in the United States that have never seen Disney World, but you know, I imagine a lot of the people that are watching have been to Disney, Disney World more than once. Um, but at, in China, they don't travel around that much. Uh, you don't have a lot of cars, you can take the train, but it's tough to relocate. So uh, most of the Chinese have not seen anywhere near as much of the top 10 things to see in China as the tourists have. It's just, just something to think about a little bit there. Um, <clears throat> we're now going to Tibet. Now, Tibet, although it is definitely part of China, uh, you need to have tourist stamps, essentially, and a permit to go there. So the, the piece of paper behind has the passport numbers, I think that's what it is, for all 16 of the people that are on the trip with us. 
and then various officials have to stamp all of this and our guide is, is holding this paperwork. Uh, so to leave and um, not leave, but to go to this other part of China because it is a, a semi-autonomous region, um, you, you actually need to ask permission. And that's what this is. And since we're in an airport, of course, there's a subway in the airport. But flying over, this is like sort of like flying over our Rockies to get there. And we're now in Lhasa. Uh, the Patala Palace, which we will visit in a little while, is the red facility there in the middle. We are now at 12,000 feet at this level. I'm not sure how high the peaks are up there, but you know, the 12,000 feet here in Summit County is uh, the T-bar, the top of the T-bar here on Peak 8 in Breckenridge. So that's, that's town. And there's, it's in a quite a large valley. Uh, and we're gonna go to the Zhokang, Zhokang Temple uh, on a walking tour. We're, we're walking through um, Lhasa here and notice that in the middle of the picture is a Burger King. So there's lots of uh, Western places to go eat there too, if you want, but this temple is 1300 years old. Uh, there is a circumambulation, which is a devotional practice around temples and such. You know, you, you walk around it, it's a kilometer around the temple. So six tenths of a mile around the facility. And that's what people go there to do. This is the morning, um, sun's coming up over the top of the temple. And if you're more religious, you are prone, prostrate there at the edge of the, at the edge of the temple. I'm not sure how many times the people visit the temple during the month or the week. The day we were there, uh, there were no Asians inside. There were very few tourists. Um, so we got to go in and look around. Uh, you, like a lot of religious facilities around the world, you can't take pictures inside of things like temples and churches sometimes. And we did observe that. Uh, so unfortunately, you're not going to see a lot of the actual religious facilities, but I've got a few pictures that, of what some of these places might look like inside. Architecture was just insanely pretty and colorful. Uh, this is along the entrance, but a Buddha um, mural. And we're back outside again. So now we're walking around the temple. It's the right-hand wall here, but it, this is just very colorful um, shops. You could get anything. You get your teeth pulled. You could on the right side. You can go get your a hat. You there was a a couple places where you could you know get your down jackets and walk around with the prayer beads. And this is pre-COVID, but this is Asia. People, a lot of people wear masks just as part of their daily health. Now, if you're more religious, you get a yak apron, you get some wooden um, mittens there, if you will. You have yak covers for the toes of your shoes and you go around the temple this way. That seems like a lot of work, but great for the abs. And there are four corners and four incense burners as you walk around. And gee, look at this, KFC Pizza Hut bought the store at this corner that everybody goes around this post to get around the temple. But all ages and so forth are, are there. Um, this woman probably walks around two or three times a day herself. Or senior citizens, you get your prayer wheel drum and uh, sit on the bench and chat with your, the other elders. Now this seems like it might be an authentic Tibetan young lady. Um, no, this woman is posing in front of the drums. Um, she actually paid about 30 or $35 to be dressed up like this and then hired a photographer to take your pictures. This is what the Chinese tourists do when they go to Tibet from, I'll say, the rest of China, or mean the eastern part of China. So we're now going to go to the Sarah Monastery. We're going to visit actually three UNESCO World Heritage Sites that day, 
or those days. Um, Jokang Temple is one, Sarah Monastery is, uh, sorry, is, is not one. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be at the other two in a bit. Um, this is a monastery that was founded in the 1400s. Um, notice that the uh, four harmonious brothers of um, Buddhism are here, the elephant with the monkey and the hare and the bird. And I'll let you look this up on Wikipedia if you don't know what the story is here about how they uh, get along together. And there's always a tree uh, behind because this is a part of the whole story. But um, the locals are out in force. This was, uh, I think we were there on a Sunday actually. And we're in part of the monastery. They have, this is a sand mandala, um, one that they keep around. Um, as you know, mandala, sometimes they make them and then they destroy them almost right away. But I'll zoom in a bit and you can see the amount of detail that somebody went to. I mean, this thing is about five feet square. Um, And this is the, uh, the meeting hall of the monastery, assembly hall. Uh, again, the, the colors are just insanely bright there. And because this is not actually a temple, um, it seemed okay or it was okay for us to take pictures inside. Uh, many of the temple facilities are maybe smaller in scope be because of there may be more rooms or some larger but lots of flags, lots of decorations on every post, every surface is covered with something. Um, Buddha back in the back, Buddha on the top, sorry, a couple Buddhas over to the right. Uh, yak butter candles. So the, the place does have a, a bit of an odor of- I don't think that butter. I can do full screen but, or any TV screen, but I might. Okay. If everyone can make sure they're on mute, that would be great. Um, so this this uh, area here, you can get a little bit of scale. There's a, a head down in the lower right, actually. But you might say, how much detail is there really? It seems really detailed. Well, it, if we take the area, just this area down here and zoom in, uh, I don't know what this is made out of, but this this is just a huge amount of I'll say devotion because it's a, it's a religious uh, um, theme. There is a print shop there. This is the old style of, of printing some of the religious texts. Uh, my hand there on is sort of for scale, but uh, this piece of wood is about twice as long and then you would you know roll it roll this over with ink and a piece of paper uh, and that, that's how the printed for a thousand years. Uh, occasionally I throw in a picture with the locals. A lot of people there have never seen or really rarely seen a Westerner, especially the kids. So anything you do with selfies, we have a, a few throughout the show here. Um, you know, they're just like, what is this person? He's got a white beard and yeah. So this is the second UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is the summer house or, or garden of the Dalai Lama. Um, you may know that the Dalai Lama, the last Dalai Lama is in India now in exile. He fled in 1959 when the communists chased him out. Um, in the center of the, this picture is the summer house and then there's some gardens around. Uh, again, we got to go into uh, the gardens and into the garden, this is the house, but once you enter the house, um, the pictures were forbidden, but the gardens were just uh, beautiful. And, and uh, you know, there's more people walking around than you think, but um, there were three or four guys here that just wanted to take a picture with me. And they were looking at the garden, but they, they were happy to have a picture with me to, to share. Look, there was a Western guy at the garden today. Another highlight, the Potala Palace. Um, this was built in its current form, more or less in the 1600s, but is much older than that as a devotional facility uh, on top of this mountain. Um, it's a, a thousand feet of total elevation. 
the next morning we're, we're going to go visit. So it's a thousand feet of total elevation, but it's about 400 feet from here up to the top. And all of this is just a foundation and, and stairways leading up here. A little better picture without those people in front of it. I think I have some numbers, yes. So this was a winter palace of the Dalai Lamas from 1649 to 1959. So 300 years. It's 13 stories of buildings containing over a thousand rooms, 10,000 shrines, and about 200,000 statues. So it's 384 feet on top of the hill, um, a total of almost a thousand feet above the valley floor. So we're at 12,000 now, but to go in the door, you have to walk up to uh, 12,600. And uh, just a close up shot of the top. We really only went in uh, a couple dozen rooms up at the top. Uh, it's a long climb. The, the fellow in the green jacket over here is with our group. Um, the stairs are, you know, spread out. It's really long, long space on the stairways. And you can get a little bit of a view across the valley. We're going to go over here. There's a shot from over here a little bit later in the, in the presentation. But um, the locals go there, you know, and this, somebody brought grandma, um, extended family. And that's probably mom and then a daughter and another Westerner. <laughs> resting. It took a while for some, I mean, we were in good shape for this, but it took a while for some of us, some of us to get up there. Um, this is a major facility at the top. We're going to go in the door in a little bit. And again, sorry, but I did steal a picture from the internet. And this is sort of the last picture on the way in. It says Patala Palace there on, the, on that. This is a, a room that the Dalai Lama lived in. I lifted this off the internet. I looked around for more pictures and actually um, maybe there are slideshows somewhere, but uh, there were enough monks all over this place sitting praying that uh, even bringing out an iPhone was, you know, it was just not only forbidden, but nobody goes there to steal pictures. This is actually a, a, a picture from a, uh, um, a travel company and the way out. And looking across the valley, this is, um, I think there are 400, uh, 200,000 people living in, uh, yeah, 200,000 people in Lhasa today. Um, a lot of new construction. Our hotel was over in here. That's why we got such a good picture, the night picture a little earlier of the of the uh, palace from from uh, the, the rooftop of our hotel and it was a case where our guide says i know this stairway that's always unlocked and uh, we went up there again this is now people circulating around the potala palace and these are all prayer drums in the back so some people come by and give them a spin um, as part of their uh, their devotion. Now I mentioned we'd, I'd had a picture from across the valley and this is one of the national treasures such that it's on the money. As they say, there's a, I think it's a $10 bill in the US has the US Treasury building on it. And there's a bank that's a Washington DC bank that happens to be in the picture. And they say, we're on the money um, in their ads. And they show you a picture of the back of a $10 bill. But this is a uh, there's another picture a little bit later on. I'll show you that they, this is something they, they do. Um, great vantage point. This is what we were down here for that picture, but this is what the valley looked like in somewhere 1940, 1950. Uh, no commercial development. A lot of Chinese businesses have moved there partly to stake their claim to the territory. Uh, building lots of condos, encouraging people to move there, encouraging travel from um, the rest of China to go see Tibet to just keep their, their hands in. Now, this is one of the places we went on a home visit. Um, overseas Adventure Travel features home visits on their trips to go visit a family that 
they've made some connection with. These people owned this land and farmed it. It's near the Sira Monastery. Um, but when the when communism really took over, they lost the land. And now uh, I've actually forgotten what the um, fellow in the family does now, but they, um, oh, he's a chef, okay. Uh, beautiful decorations in the home. Uh, she brought out some food for us and, and tea, some of the rest of our group here. I'll draw your attention to this uh, piece of furniture, I'll call it that, uh, down here below. I don't know, didn't ask how old or, or where this came from, but the amount of detail, I mean, look, even if you zoom in further, the amount of artwork and detail on their furniture was just amazing. And uh, she's demonstrating now uh, a butter churn. Um, of course, they don't use it now, but it was traditional. And I'll draw your attention to this poster up here um, and zoom in. And we have Mao, we have um, Chi now, and uh, two other government leaders. This is required. You, in, at least in Tibet, you, you must have this in your house. And if a communist party member comes to your house and you don't seem to have this poster prominently displayed, uh, you're in trouble. Um, yeah, it's the politics are different. I'll try and stay out of all that, but <clears throat> their kitchen, um, you know, there's a microwave in the back, but down here is yak. What, com what comes from a yak? Yeah. That's for lighting, that's for the fireplace or the, uh, the stove that's here. And why not go to the Tibetan family kitchen for dinner instead of KFC? But it seemed appropriate for them to serve us yak burger with fries. And our only comments were, uh, it's apparently a low fat meat because it's not like it's big and juicy, it's pretty dry. And we wish there was more ketchup. Um, it, was, it tasted good, it was like, a lot of you know a bison burger or something like that here that's a, just a little more gamey than the beef that you get at McDonald's or something but needs more ketchup. Now we have a distillery here in Breckenridge that claims to be the highest distillery in the world. The good news is that our breweries don't claim to be the highest breweries in the world because beer from the roof of the world here starts at 12,000 feet which you remember is up at the top of the t-bar so I don't really think that the United States could compete with uh, La Sabir as far as uh, the elevation, but of course, Patala Palace is there on their label too. Sunset, looking back at the uh, Jopang Temple, Jopang Temple, sorry. And, uh, you know, just lots of lights in the evening, uh, monks walking here and there, you know, all the cars were clean and, pretty dent free. And although this is a big valley, there's uh, fingers of mountains uh, projecting all over it. So the shortest way back to the airport that's 20 or 30 minutes out of town is actually to drill a hole through the tunnel rather than go drive all around, around the valley. But the good news is that along the way, we actually saw yak on the hoof um, domesticated, but uh, you know they're like, like our cows, but they're yaks. Again, you have to have the uh, government stamps and the airport stamps on your ticket um, to go back to China or the other, the other part of China. Chongqing is where we're going. Uh, the mountains were even more dramatic on the way out. Notice the glaciers down here. There's a glacier over here. Uh, I don't know what the elevation is up here, but this is, you know, our airplane is only flying near the top of the peaks of the mountains. So. Now we're in Chongqing. And uh, it's an administrative municipality. So it's more than just a city. There are four of these, Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin, are, which is another coastal city, 
are, uh, are parts of China that are just administered differently. This one has 33 million people in it as of the last population I looked up. There are 9 million in the city, so then there's lots more in the, in the surrounding territory, but the area is a quarter of California, just as a footprint for you. But greater Los Angeles only has 20 million in it. And California in, in its entirety has 40 million people in it roughly. So this is somewhere in between Los Angeles and, and adding in half of the rest of California. Um, squeezed into a quarter of California. And uh, Chongqing was a World War II capital because of its inland, substantially inland, it was an industrial center too. So it was difficult for um, <clears throat> the Japanese to attack. Uh, if Chongqing sounds a little familiar to uh, some of the older folks, at least maybe, you may re -re remember Chongqing Chaoming. Well, Chongqing is also known as Chongqing, Chongqing. And, uh, you know, the, the way that a lot of Americans were introduced to uh, Chinese food was Chongqing, Chaoming, I think. You know, the Chinese restaurants here were pretty exceptional at that time, exceptional in their blandness. But this area has 1.5 million square feet a day of construction between commercial and residential and factory space. So, I tried to show pictures without so many sky cranes in there, but it seems that sky cranes in China are as common as Subarus in Colorado. That's a joke. Um, we're going to go downtown and do the tourist area, but you know we are less than a tenth of a percent of the number of people visiting. Yet all the signs that we in the popular places we saw have an English side and a Chinese side. That's that's the second language. We're gonna visit the Three Gorges Museum, gorgeous facility. Uh, this is the, um, sorry, the Great Hall of Chongqing across the way. We have to take the tourist shot. Of course, they're tourists too. So this lady's posing with her finest cape there and her friend's taking the picture of her posing there in front of the Great Hall. But once inside the museum, um, it was four or five stories of exhibits were, oh, sorry, Beth has got to take a picture with the locals, they asked. Um, and her hand is actually not on that boat. You can see the shadow's different. She's just holding her hand out like it's, it's not, not really, to you're not allowed to touch the boat, right? Uh, so a large part of the museum is dedicated to uh, the Yangtze River and the flooding of the Yangtze River and the project and everything. Uh, and that's, that's what we went and saw mostly. There were some, uh, the artifacts or the artwork that we saw was mostly would have been uh, resurrected or relocated from this project. So from down here in Chongqing up to the dam, the Three Gorges Dam, Yiching is up here. Um, it's about 400 miles. So that's the difference from LA to San Francisco is that's something I use for scale anyway. At the dam, the water is 360 feet higher than downstream. So this was a big flood control project because the flooding of all these areas were just extreme for forever. But this is a listing, now there aren't English explanations here, but how they relocated, sorry, how they relocated or where they relocated people and where they needed to relocate people to get them out of harm's way, because of course they're living alongside the river, but they displaced 1.3 million people um, since this project was started. And they started, it's been hoped for for a hundred years, but uh, they didn't actually start building it till 1994. And they finished it, meaning the last bits of the, of the dam and the hydro facilities, hydroelectric facilities were completed in 2012. Um, it had actually begun filling before then. But I think I said 1.3 million people were displaced. And there's a lot of signage, uh, the major architect of the planner. I mean, this is your William Mulholland of, uh, of water projects. Um, he, he, built a, he designed a lot of what happened in California um, and some history back there. But a lot of things were dislocated, a lot of religious shrines. This is seven, seven feet tall um were relocated to their credit from uh from areas that be became flooded 
uh, I left this here just for, so I remember to say that these are figures from a thousand years ago. They're actually about um, tall, but I got close enough to them to see some of the uh, enamel. Um, and there were just hundreds of exhibits like this throughout. No good museum is without some pornography, um, some temple rubbings and some stone. And uh, the little fellow there on the left, I think is named Viagra in Chinese. It's how it's pronounced, I'm not sure. That's a joke. This is a, a wall uh, from a temple that was recovered and relocated. A uh, little bit busy on this slide, but if I zoom in, you know, this is eight by four, maybe, uh, of, of that wall. So um, a lot of inscription, if you will. This is even older. This is from 12 to 1400 years ago. Uh, this was, I'm reading to myself, these Buddhist statues coming up in this niche are, um, you know, somewhat aged in the weather now, but it was all uh, thankfully relocated to the museum so people can, can uh, more people can see it than probably did when it was somewhere along the riverbed. Uh, wonderful carving, uh, probably eight feet long, um, brought to the museum. And more girls and tourists, or Chinese tourists visiting with the American tourist. This is a big thing. Um, I think it was Sunday afternoon and the women are out here with their batons just in, in between the Great Hall and the museum, um, getting a little exercise. But like all good Westerners, what did we do? We went to KFC and got ice cream. It was a hot day. Okay, this is a trademark blue color. It's copyrighted by who? Walmart. There's a sign on the left and the sign on the right. This is an underground Walmart that more or less stretches back underneath the Great Hall. And many of you probably know that a lot of other countries don't box their eggs up or refrigerate them. Those are eggs there on the left. Uh, their shells just must be a lot more um, sturdy than the shells on Western eggs. But you know, supermarket, the milk is labeled in English. But you can go point out the fish you want, or you can grab the net and grab the fish you want and take it to the counter and it's yours. But our Walmarts are a bit colorful. I think they've gone over the top here. Of course, Chips Ahoy and Oreos. The thing that I notice is missing from this though is that there is no Nabisco um, label on this, the National Biscuit Company that is an American firm, but we bought a bag anyway. So we're out by the river here in China or in uh, Zhong, um, Chongqing. Uh, lots of people on the promenade, lots of big buildings across the way. And that is actually the National Theater across the way. It's gonna light up a little bit later on, but you know, the good news about river sides is that they're relatively flat. I have no idea how much this fella is dragging along, but not everybody has a tuk-tuk or a car to tow all this stuff around. So this is his job. Speaking of jobs, this is this fellow's job. He's a stick man. And our guide said, you know, it's good graces to, to have the stick man take your personal luggage down to the boat. Our big stuff was, was taken elsewhere, but it was either 50 cents or a dollar. I think it was 50 cents to have him take your bag. Notice there's wheels on the bottom of our luggage, but this is this guy's job. This is what he does. He stows, shows up with his piece of bamboo and a couple, some ropes and takes cruise ship passengers um, like this fella is waiting to do, take stuff down to the boats for people. And this is our boat. Uh, there's 266 passengers. This is actually an American owned cruise line called Victoria Cruise Lines, but all the rest of the passengers were um, Asian, Chinese. And uh, the only crew member that seemed to speak English well was the cruise director. And we are gonna depart from Chongqing here a little later in the evening. It's four days and three nights on the river. 
and we're gonna make several stops, Fengdu, um, a, a, see a, an evening show. Uh, we're gonna visit something called the Goddess Stream on a different boat and end up 400 miles from here at the Three Gorges Dam. So cruise ship, dining room, um, night shot as they light up the buildings. And they're very active. And even you can see that sometimes the graphics stretch from one building to another. And they had some political uh, military kind of displays on the side of the, the um, theater um, you know, as we went down the river. We're in Fengdu, we're gonna visit this apartment building in a little while. Uh, we're looking, our boat is here. Um, looking back at the new side of the river, this is the old side of the river. Um, and we went to some markets down there. This is a, a thousand year old egg, I think that she's showing us. Um, and this child is just like, who are these people? But you can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant, chicken feet, sure. But greens and everything else you'd find in a market. And just down the way, you can get a mausoleum if you want. It's 